We stand in a key moment as a diocese uh, now. Uh, we are, uh, as it were, 99 not out. Uh, we're 100 uh, next year. Uh, uh, approaching our centenary. And we want to give thanks in that centenary for all that's been good in the last 100 years in the life of the church in this diocese. And we want to seek God's strength and sustain our common life and mission by the grace of God into the next uh, 100 years. And just to remind you, together we serve a community of 1.3 million people, which is a serious responsibility in the city and towns across this uh, region and many villages and small communities too. And we serve those communities through more than 200 uh, local churches, through 40 schools, through hundreds of community projects, through being salt and light uh, across this region with our ecumenical partners. And we're entrusted, as we serve this community, with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And just to remind us, together, uh, on this day, the gospel message is nothing less than the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And the good news of Jesus Christ we're called to carry is not a human invention or a human construction but the revelation of God's grace to humankind uh, rooted in God's plan that began with creation. The gospel offers forgiveness of sins for those who are alienated from God and a renewed relationship with one another. The gospel offers guidance for the lost, spiritual food for the hungry, healing for the broken in spirit, freedom for those who are captives, order and safety for those whose lives are in chaos, fruitfulness for those whose lives are barren. The gospel offers a gift of life in all its fullness, fellowship in the life of God, the Trinity, both now and for all eternity. The gospel offers the rich gift of resurrection and life beyond death, for in Christ the power of death itself has been vanquished and resurrection life is offered to all. And the gospel offers hope for the transformation of the world both through the witness and actions of the people of God as agents of change and most of all in the promises of God that the kingdom will come in all its fullness and that Christ will be Lord of all. So the church we are part of in our parishes and deaneries and partnerships and across the diocese has this high calling we are a sign and instrument of God's kingdom on the earth. A channel of peace and reconciliation in a world that's divided. A witness to God's purpose for humanity. And an agent of God's compassion in the world. Called to discover what God is doing and to join in. We know within that panorama what kind of church we're called to grow. Next slide, please. The Diocese of Sheffield is called to grow a sustainable network of Christly, lively, and diverse Christian communities in every place, which are effective in making disciples and in transforming our society and God's world. We know a little of what we need to do to become more that kind of church. Next slide, please. We're encouraging one another to be salt and light in our communities. We're encouraging one another to grow the body of Christ. Next slide, please. Through an annual cycle of sowing the seed of the gospel, teaching the faith to inquirers and new Christians, and equipping every Christian disciple. And hopefully the pilgrim resource will support that pattern. We know what we need to do, next slide, to reimagine ministry for mission. And uh, that's all been about our theme for today to develop mission partnerships of many different kinds, partnerships between parishes, partnerships between ordained and lay, adventure of, adventures of faith, to carry the gospel into the world and to shape the church of the future. And all that means new ways of working, but as we came on to at the end of our panel time just now, all of that is only possible 
through prayer and as God works in our lives. That's why I want to end this day by asking you to carry away and think about one specific prayer. It's one of the best known Christian prayers of every age. Almost certainly you'll know it by heart. It's a prayer taken from the scriptures from the very end of 2 Corinthians. It's often used in our public worship and at the end of our meetings. But I'm going to suggest you use it at the beginning of your meetings from now on and be different. It's a, uh, we call it the grace. And I want us to end our day by thinking about these words for a few moments. This is the text that has appears in the New Revised Standard Version, and slightly different from the normal version that we say in our liturgy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Some years ago, I was part of a, a panel, not unlike the one we just had at a day conference exploring Christian leadership. And someone asked a challenging question, uh, and it was one of those questions that was more of a statement. Uh, and they commented uh, that many clergy find it extraordinarily difficult to work in partnership. And I stumbled over my own answer, but one of the other members of the panel was a senior professor in a business school. And she'd spent her life observing the way people work in leadership and management in many different fields. And her reply was crystal clear, and I've never forgotten it. She said, it's not that clergy find it more difficult than anybody else to work in partnership. She said, working in partnership is simply very difficult and challenging for anyone in any field. Good working partnerships are actually quite rare. We all need to work on working together. She went on to say that working in partnership is also very powerful. Teams are effective because they're greater than the sum of their parts. We learn best when we're working together in trusting relationships. And I held on to that uh, challenging and comforting thought that working together with others can be so very hard but it really is so very worthwhile. And that's exactly the picture we find in 1 and 2 Corinthians, especially 2 Corinthians, which is where I've been trying to live for the last six months or so in my own uh, uh, biblical study. Paul is striving through the whole of 2 Corinthians to do exactly what we've been doing today. Paul is striving to build a sense of partnership in mission between the Corinthian church and the wider church. The whole letter is about mission partnership. Relationships are fractured between Paul and this community. Uh, there's very little trust. There's been very poor communication. The church is divided internally and divided externally. And that affects the whole of its life and mission. And broadly speaking, Paul seeks in 1 Corinthians to heal the effects of internal division by his words and by his counsel. And he's seeking in 2 Corinthians to heal external division, the fracture between this church and the wider church. He wants to build them up through talking to them about reconciliation, through sharing his heart and his life, through involving the Corinthians in the collection for the saints in Jerusalem, and all for the sake of partnership in mission. So this final verse of the, the two letters uh, which are a substantial part of the New Testament, the final verse of these two letters, the grace, is not just a prayer that he writes at the end. It's an offering and celebrating the key to mission partnership. The letters lead into the prayer. And it's a kind of shorthand for carrying the lessons of 2 Corinthians into everyday life and ministry, for weaving them in, uh, to use Olive's lovely image. Partnership in God's mission is only possible because of what God provides. As you work together in mission partnership with God and with one another, 
he's saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. The prayer's got three clauses, each with a quality. One quality is ascribed to Jesus Christ, one to God, and one to the Holy Spirit. Paul believes and understands God as Trinity, three persons within one Godhead, though it will take the church many years to find the language to contain the truth he's articulating. And at the heart of God is community, as John was saying this morning uh, from his exposition of Genesis. At the heart of God is partnership, partnership in mission. The Father sends the Son. We heard about the Missio Dei, the mission of God. The Father and the Son send the Spirit. The Father, Son, and Spirit call and send the church in the rhythm of worship, communion, and mission. God the Trinity is calling us into the divine partnership which is mission. And we're called to mirror and reflect in our own lives, in our own structures, that sense of collaboration and working together and joining hands with God as we share in God's mission to the world. And because God is Trinity, these three qualities in the grace are interchangeable to some degree. Love is a quality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So is grace, so is communion. But we can argue that these qualities are revealed and seen first and most clearly in the person they are linked with here, the person of the Trinity. And so we need to understand them and receive them and practice them in all our mission partnerships. For unless our partnerships are grounded in partnership with God, they won't work as partnerships and they won't work as mission. Grace is revealed first and foremost in Jesus Christ. Grace is God's undeserved gift to us in Jesus, sent to the world to be our saviour. Grace is the quality that pervades all of Jesus' life and ministry and teaching, and especially his encounters with people. And I would suggest grace and generosity need to be the foundation of mission partnerships. We need to know first and foremost what God has given us in Jesus, generously and without reserve. And for that reason, we are to give openly and generously to others, openly and without reserve, trusting to God's mercy for the outcome. We practice our generosity first and foremost with one another so that the same grace and generosity can flow out in God's mission to the world. As you explore uh, mission partnerships, seek to keep this grace and generosity of Jesus uh, as the first foundation. Especially keep grace and generosity in conversations and meetings. I have to listen to Christians say hard things and honest things to one another sometimes, uh, particularly when we're discussing uh, futures of ministries and parishes. And I want to ask you in all those conversations, as you speak to one another, to remember the grace and generosity of Christ. We need our partnerships to be founded there and we need to, them to be found as second on the love of God. As you may know, there are many different words for love in the New Testament. The word in this prayer is agape. It's the same word Paul has used in his great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. This is not contract love, which says I'll do something for you if you do something for me. This is the love which flows from grace. This is love for the person or community which does not deserve love. And this is the love God has for us. And we know what this love of God is like because Paul has described it in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist in its own way. We often read them in the marriage service and it's right that we should. But maybe we should read them more often in PCC meetings and deanery meetings and in all of the meetings where we discuss mission partnerships because they were originally written about growing a Christ-like church. Pay attention to them. 
The only way forward for mission partnerships is love, the love of God and costly sacrificial love for each other, which overflows in love for the world. And finally, Paul comes to the attribute revealed first through, through the Holy Spirit. This is communion, this is fellowship, this is partnership. The original word is koinonia, which means all of those things and which underscores uh, all of what we're doing now in the diocese about partnership in mission. We can't work together at any level unless we're joined together in communion first, in fellowship and in partnership as Christians. The one who joins us together is the Holy Spirit. We begin to know that fellowship and partnership as we talk together and share our stories and perspectives, as we learn to be vulnerable, as we trust one another, as we forgive one another when we get things wrong, as we eat together, as we worship and pray together. As we heard from Mark, a mission partnership will never be formed only in formal meetings together. A mission partnership is formed as we spend time together, get to know one another, eat together, share fellowship, pray and worship. That's where we build the bonds of communion which are strong enough to bear the weight of common working. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are gifts which have been given to us which we have not yet fully appreciated or received. They are vital foundations for what we're called to grow in the name of Christ in this diocese. Use the words not at the end of your meetings as the last thing you think about in the evening, but use them at the beginning as the foundation for what you do. Grace, love, communion together the foundations of mission partnerships.